Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News and day two of this special run of all viewer question episodes while well, I'm away on a personal vacation through February 26th. So the first question of the day is from Oren Cohen and Oren says, hey Grace, when I filled out the Oscar poll this year, he's talking about Beyond the Trailers Oscar poll, which if you yourself would like to participate, I've put a link below in the video description. Uh, but Oren says, while I was filling it out, I thought about the best main actress category. And I had to write in Jennifer Lawrence for The Hunger Games 2 Catching Fire. If Sigourney Weaver was nominated for Alien, uh, Aliens actually, the second film, uh, for Alan Ripley, and Johnny Depp was nominated for Jack Sparrow, Oren says, I want uh, Jennifer Lawrence to at least be nominated for this role of Katniss. Do you think the Academy will, or even can, return to these kind of nominees? Good question, Oren, and I think one uh, that a lot of people have these days with so many favorite characters in these big blockbusters. And I think, to her credit, Jennifer Lawrence is a big part of why this franchise is so successful, The Hunger Games. Not only are people enjoying seeing their favorite books adapted for the big screen, but I think she's become a very likable actress with a very large fan base, and people do go to see her. I think she is a draw, uh, and also over in X-Men as well. I mean, she is just right now at the heart of a perfect storm of movie stardom. So that's, a, that's great for her. However, I have to say that in the role itself, I don't think Jennifer Lawrence is really doing anything new here, and that's why she's not getting nominated. Now, I think the Academy still is game to nominate these kind of performances in blockbuster films. Johnny Depp, recent nomination. Also, of course, Heath Ledger was a win for The Dark Knight for The Joker. Uh, I think his, you know, having passed away played into that somewhat, because uh, usually the Academy is reluctant to, you know, to actually give wins here. But of course, Heath Ledger's performance there was so iconic, so special, that I think he would have won either way. And there was, his family did mention that he kind of knew that he was doing something that special uh, with the role. Likewise, likewise with Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp changed, you know, also helped to contribute to the change of blockbuster films uh, and their quality, the level of quality. Both Heath Ledger and Johnny Depp, I think, have, have brought that in there. I think they both made it okay for serious actors to act in these uh, franchises and to do great work uh, to try and challenge themselves and bring their own ideas to their characters. Both of them did that with their uh, with the Joker and Jack Sparrow as opposed to like well this is just a paycheck movie I can just phone it in here. Uh, like for instance Tommy Lee Jones is a great actor but I think clearly from the way he did Two-Face you know of course Joel Schumacher contributed to that you know disaster but I don't think that you know Tommy Lee Jones approached that role the same way he would perhaps a smaller film or a more artistic, uh, artistically, credi artistically credible film at the time. So both those actors, I think Heath Ledger and Johnny Depp, made these films more, you know, art have more credibility as art. Now, as when you think about those, when you compare Jennifer Lawrence's performance to those two roles, I think you don't see that. Even though, even when you go back to Sigourney Weaver, that was very new for female action heroes at the time. She started a whole trend, uh, and she was she opened the door for all the female action heroes who have come after her. Uh, and I think there were a lot of great uh, psychological aspects going on to her character, Ellen Ripley, in Aliens as well, which I think helped her get that nomination, because she wasn't nominated for the first movie. Uh, I think that playing off the, the mother aspect, which is a pet peeve of mine, though, by the way, as many of you know, always saddling female characters with family issues. Uh, sometimes male characters have the same situation, but uh, but that's a whole other conversation. But anyway, you know, that, that those psychological aspects were brought in, you know, the passing of her own children, because she had been lost in that, you know, frozen in time, in her space travels and how that had her with uh, Newt, I believe that was the girl's name, how that factored in there, the loss of her own children. So I think there was a lot going on there. And of course, again, I think the Academy realized that Sigourney Weaver was doing something special there and deserved to be nominated. But Jennifer Lawrence, even though she is so responsible for the success uh, of the Hunger Games franchise, I think on screen, she's not really, you know, breaking new ground. She's not, you know, furthering the, you know, the kind of roles that women will get going forward. And I don't think it's necessarily all Jennifer Lawrence's fault. I think the role of Katniss is a very passive role. It's a reactionary role. Katniss reacts to things that are done to her. She's rarely, uh, you know, intentionally the catalyst for any events going on. She actually, you know, says, I don't want to play this part, but she's just forced into it anyway, finds herself there. She's a pawn. Um, and that's not any fault of Jennifer Lawrence's or even the source material. That's the way it's written. And it's, it's about, you know, the power of pawns and what it means to be a pawn, what it's like to just be, you know, uh, manipulated by other people for their own means, even if it is for the greater good, which is all very interesting. But at the same time, it doesn't really give Jennifer Lawrence the kind of meaty role that would allow her to create something that's worthy of being nominated for an Oscar. So I think we can take heart that with the Jack Sparrow, you know, Johnny Depp and Heath Ledger Joker nominations, the Academy is still open to these kind of, you know, 
considering these roles, but you really have to do something special with it. And I just think, and I, Oren, I'm so happy that you like Jennifer Lawrence in the role enough to write her name down as a write-in in the BTT Oscar poll, but I think at large, I just don't think that there's any Oscar momentum there. All right, so that's the first question of the day. The second is from Matt, because thanks for signing it, Matt, because your handle is like Epson A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So uh, I would have been very hard to keep referencing that. So Matt says, question, greetings from the UK, recent viewer. Awesome, welcome, Matt. Uh, recent questioner as well, awesome. My question is, do you think it is right for actors to only be remembered for one role, regardless of how iconic it was? For instance, when I was watching Thor The Dark World, I couldn't shake the image of Christopher Ecclesian, I think that's how you pronounce his name, as Doctor Who out of my head. It was a little annoying, especially as he was only in it for one series nine years ago and has done plenty of other critically acclaimed roles before and since. So Matt's wondering, why is this happening and why is it really fair to the actors? Now, the reason I like this question uh, is because I think a lot of people wonder about it, but also it reminds me of uh, David Schwimmer, who of course was, became famous for playing Ross on Friends. And he made quite a fuss after Friends ended that nobody saw him as anything but Ross. And he felt it was really hurting his career and getting other roles, and he felt it had become a negative thing for him. And I really thought that, I resented that at the time when David Schwimmer was making these very vocal complaints, because when you think of all the actors, all the members of SAG, who never get to, to practice their craft on that broad of a level, on TV or in film, uh, never really make it, any actor should just consider themselves lucky to get a role that is so beloved by audiences. It is Acting is one of the most difficult professions out there. You have very little control over it yourself. I mean, some people become uh, talented behind the camera as writer-directors to almost give, to give themselves that first big break. Brett Marling, for instance, is doing that recently. Vince Vaughn and John Favreau, that's how they got into uh, being able to make movies. They gave themselves a part. They cast themselves. So that's one route. But in general, it's very difficult for actors to break in uh, because they need to be picked. Someone needs to pick them. They have no power over uh, whether or not they, they make it. Uh, so if an actor is fortunate enough to get picked and land a role that is just icon becomes iconic, they should. that's just great. And that's their contribution to the world of entertainment. Good for them. And they should never become bitter over it. I think it's horrible that Alec Guinness was so bitter over being Obi-Wan Kenobi because that's what most people ended up remembering him as. Uh, he should be happy that he was able to contribute to something that became such a cultural phenomenon and brought many, so many people so much joy. So you really have to ask yourself, why are you becoming an actor? And if you're not becoming an actor to entertain people and give them joy, don't go into mainstream entertainment because that's the purpose of mainstream entertainment. Stick to the smaller independent films and the, you know, th the theater because that's where you should belong. So I, I don't know, I'm sure Christopher, I have no idea if Christopher Ecclesian feels bad about this at all, but I think he should be happy that he played Doctor Who and that's really the thing that keeps him on any casting director's radar. People being like, well, hey, people liked him as Doctor Who, maybe we can use him as this. Although I do think it keeps him from getting anything maybe really major going forward because he's already Doctor Who. But Eddie Cumberbatch is suffering from that a little bit as well, is that he's already so iconically Sherlock. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Sherlock in the third viewer question. But so anyway, that's why that happens. And also, you know, if someone's just so good in a role, look at Jennifer Lawrence. Uh, I think she's maybe a little bit fortunate to be playing Mystique and Katniss at the same time so that people don't really see. I don't think she really disappears into either role, though. That's kind of like the, the negative aspect of that. I think Jennifer Lawrence, when I see her in either role, she's Jennifer Lawrence uh, playing Katniss or playing um, Mystique. I don't, you know, she isn't that character. Not quite like Harrison Ford is Han Solo, and interestingly was able to also become Indiana Jones. I think he's one of the few actors to pull off multiple iconic roles. But you know, Daniel Craig, for instance, he struggled for most of his entire career, and he should be so happy that he got to be James Bond, and many people's favorite James Bond, and he'll probably always be James Bond to many of those people. But you know, it's allowed him to reach a, a level um, of success that he otherwise would not have reached, I don't think. All right, so that's my answer to your question, Matt. I hope that was uh, helpful. All right, so the third question, this is just, you know, not quite with movies, but I, I get asked a lot about my thoughts on TV, so I thought I would answer it during this run of viewer questions. And DJ, DJ Hernandez says, question. Grace, if you're collecting questions, I am. Uh, can you please tell us your top five TV shows on TV now? We all know the quality of TV has gotten a lot better these days, uh, and that's how we're going to cheat and tie this into film. Uh, and I would love to, because it's affecting film and stealing audience members from it. And I would love to know what your favorite shows are on TV right now. Thanks, Grace. Smiley face. All right, DJ, let's play. And I cheated a little bit here because there's so much good stuff on TV now. I've grouped it a little bit by, um, uh, you know, by, by network. All right, so let's start out, as I said, Sherlock. I mentioned Sherlock. I think that PBS... Uh, which is airing those shows in the United States right now, 
Downton Abbey and Sherlock, kind of like a one-two punch, their Sunday night lineup, drawing in more viewers than ever before to PBS. PBS is actually starting to run like branding commercials on their network, like a real network, which I think is fascinating to see them develop into an actual uh, ratings contender, uh, new ground for PBS. But really two wonderful shows and really just shows why BBC is such a powerhouse itself and has been way before the United States in terms of the quality of their television. Both shows are very well written, very smart, uh, and also, you know, they play with length. And, and also they don't run for as long as an American series, which I also think is interesting. Although um, cable TV is, I think, taking its cues from the BBC uh, programming. Uh, and forgive me if one of these airs on ITV, I apologize. But we all think of it as BBC. Uh, so anyway, I think both Sherlock and Downton Abbey have been on fire. I'm still enjoying mo both immensely. And you're seeing some of that talent pop up in other places as well. But, you know, they are really, you know, they're, they're very much a slave to these successes. You know, they said they wanted to make Sherlock for as long as Cumberbatch would make it. Uh, I hope he never gives up. I think the episodes have been phenomenal. Even that wedding episode recently, which I thought was going to be really ho-hum, uh, turned to be really brilliant bit of writing. I really do respect writing. Uh, all right, so the second group of uh, television shows I like is over on HBO. I actually have two sets of things from HBO, um, but I'm categorizing them because they're so different in tone. So this grouping is True Detective and Game of Thrones. I think they're both really awesome, amazing shows that have the quality of a, a film. I think that is, these other, these other shows that I'm talking about seem like TV shows, but I think Game of Thrones and True Detective operate on the level of, actually operate on the level of film, and I think as a result have a fan base you know, at the level of, the, of uh, that a movie or movie franchise would. I think both are excellent. They have top-notch production values, which I think also really helps both of them. Uh, and I think on True Detective, you're looking at some really great, like, you know, acting, you know, like very art, very artiste. I think you're really seeing, you know, um, actors being allowed to strut their stuff, both Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson, who is very underrated as an actor. He's very good. And then over on Game of Thrones, you have a great amount of spectacle, very clever writing, a great, um, you know, large cast, whereas True Detective really boils down to just two actors playing off of each other. Uh, but Game of Thrones uh, has a very large cast where I think everybody contributes and does a very good job. Uh, great show, really uh, in a class by itself, actually. So I'm sorry I paired it with True Detective. All right, and also on HBO, I really wanted to sh give a shout out to Veep. I love Veep. I think Veep is a phenomenal show. I picked it over Girls, actually, and didn't pair it with Girls because I think Girls is losing its way a little bit. It's, uh, I think it's focusing too much on trying to be titillating, both in terms of the, the nudity, which has become a big subject matter, but also I feel um, with it's trying to make its characters unlikable, I, I think it's really not going anywhere. I think maybe Girls might have bought a little bit into its own, too much into its own hype. Am I still watching it? Yes, but I feel I'm one of the few people holding on. But Veep is a wonderful show, a great performance by Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Talk about an actress who's been able to play multiple roles. You know, people have been talking about that, that she was Elaine on Seinfeld, she was uh, Christine on The New Adventures of Old Christine, and now she's, uh, you know, this character on Veep, uh, uh, Selena, Selena Meyer, uh, who just does such a wonderful job that Julia, Julia Louis-Dreyfus has one of those few actresses to be able to play all these different roles and be seen individually and not just be like, hey, it's Elaine as vice president. Uh, I think the show is phenomenal. I think that uh, it's, an, it's a great example. Uh, I love the fashions, by the way, that she wears. I know it's a very girly response, but I think that the costume design on the show is so great because it allows um, Julia Louis-Dreyfus to look really pretty, but at the same time be taken seriously in a business environment. It's very hard to do. Any woman who's tried to shop for clothes to wear to work knows this, I think, that it's so hard to find clothes that are not trying too hard to be sexy or you won't be taken seriously in, but at the same time you still want to look attractive. So I love the clothing on Veep, and they don't really talk about who the cost, who does the clothing, but I've made it a, a personal goal of mine to start researching that when I get back from vacation. Uh, and also it's a great example of women in the workplace. She's fully functioning, uh, but also with problems as well as successes. Uh, and I really like showing her, you know, a woman is the boss, but you know, not like wanting to, you know, not like in a sexy way, but just in a real way. And so I really like that show for those reasons. I think it's phenomenally good. All right, so the other two show, two, I, have, I have five, so that's the first three. Then also AMC, of course, obviously Breaking Bad has been iconic. Uh, Mad Men, that, it'll be interesting to see what happens to, I'm not a big fan of The Walking Dead, that's why I didn't group it in here. I don't like zombies, The Walking Dead's a little slow for me, I just never have gotten into that. Uh, but I did like Breaking Bad quite a bit, and of course I'm a big Mad Men fan. I think it's time for Mad Men to end, just as it was time for Breaking Bad to end. I actually like this new trend of shows ending, because it becomes a big deal, they can be wrapped up properly, and I think because the creators are in on the decision to end the show, instead of it being a negative thing, where they're like, we got cancelled, who cares anymore? They're able to cra 
Warcraft, really fascinating ending that um, reflects on the show. Like, I'm excited what, Ma what Mad Men might do. I'm hoping maybe there will even be a time jump where we can see what happens to these characters uh, way beyond, you know, this, the, the 60s and maybe even the 70s or 80s. I would be really curious to know what happens to them. Uh, but anyway, I think that's great programming over there, uh, and I, I really like what AMC is doing. And they are one of the, you know, they really gave HBO a run for their money, and, you know, of course, we all benefit from tough competition as viewers. All right, so the other show I really like uh, is Justified. I'm going to have to say, Justified, I almost stopped watching it this season, but Michael Rappaport is doing a fantastic job as this really crazy Southern villain. Uh, his accent, I love it, but yet he's able to show real menace, even though he's kind of usually a goofy actor. Uh, I love Walton Goggins on the show. Timothy Oliphant is fantastic. Another example of great writing, very clever writing. A lot of their characters are very loquacious, but yet it never gets old or seems forced. They really do a good job keeping it fresh. And every time I think I've gotten tired of the show, they find a new plot twist or a new character to re get me interested again. Now, of course, Justified is also, I think, going to be coming to an end on the next season. I'll be interested to see how they wrap that up. But it's really been a great bit of television. And if you're ever looking for a show, and if you're like, oh, I don't really like anything that's on right now, I would tell you it's worth your time to get into Justified. You can work your way through the seasons. It's a very good example of FX programming, which I think they haven't quite matched. The Americans is okay, but I think it's not, it's spotty. It's not as solid as Justified. Really great show. And in the spirit of Elmore Leonard, by the way, perhaps maybe the best adaptation of Elmore Leonard's work to date, which again benefited from the TV um, structure because it had time to explore those characters the way an Elmore novel, Elmore Leonard novel would. All right, sorry, I'm losing my voice. I'm recording all these viewer question episodes on the same day. So, all right. So I hope you'll tune in for the rest of this run again through, through February 26th. Everybody, thank you for your questions, Oren, Matt, and DJ. Uh, and tomorrow, maybe your question will be answered. Thanks for watching. Bye.